Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out on Bonfire Night to decide whether the Eurozone is going to burst into flames. My little pun. So, welcome to our joint Wilberforce Society, Marshall Society, Cambridge Union panel event on the future of the Eurozone. We're delighted that these three societies have been able to come together for the first time ever to hold an event. So, before we get started, I'll just give a tiny introduction to each society. The Wilberforce Society is Cambridge's student think tank. It's one of the university's youngest political societies. Completely non-partisan, it allows Cambridge students to broaden their knowledge of public policy, get involved in researching and designing innovative new policy ideas, and getting ideas heard by professionals in policy. The Marshall Society is the official economic society of the university, designed to bring together students in Cambridge who are interested in economics, regardless of the degree they study. It invites speakers and organises seminars and events to stimulate discussion on contemporary economic issues. And finally, the Cambridge Union, where we are today, the university's largest student society, exists to promote free speech and the art of public speaking. We have a fantastic panel lined up this evening, so please welcome Dr. Ray Barrell, Professor of Economics at Brunel University and former Director of Macroeconomics at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Dr. Patrick Gerrards, Lecturer in Economics here in Cambridge and an advisor to the IMF. Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And Mats Pearson, Director of the think tank Open Europe. The format of the event will be each speaker making five to ten minutes of remarks about the future of the Eurozone, followed by an audience Q&A, and we should be wrapped up by 8.30 to 8.45 to allow you to go and have fun with the bonfires and all that. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to our first panellist, Dr. Gerrards. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, basically, the most important thing to realise when it comes to the Euro area is that it's not what is called an optimum currency area. An optimum currency area is an area in which, for each country, it's best to adopt a common currency rather than to have separate currencies that are floating vis-a-vis -vis each other. And whether or not you have a currency area or floating exchange rates wouldn't make a big difference if the region is entirely homogeneous. Uh, but in practice, because then if the region is hit by a shock, they can just use the common monetary policy to respond to the shock, the exchange rate could respond if there's a negative shock, all would be fine. The problems arise when the, the region is not homogeneous, and that's exactly what we observe in the euro area. There are massive differences between Germany, Greece, Portugal, Austria, Finland. Uh, so, as a result, in the European Monetary Union, we observe the country-specific shocks. So these, these are asymmetric shocks, and they cause problems. Because if you have flexible exchange rates, then what happens if one country is hit by a negative shock? Then that country can implement expansionary monetary policy, uh, reducing interest rates, uh, the currency would depreciate, leading to an expansion of exports, and the economy would be able to adjust fairly quickly. But if that country is part of a currency area, then monetary policy is determined by a single central bank, the European Central Bank in this case, and you would no longer have the opportunity to adjust the exchange rate. So that's where the problems arise. Now, the several criteria as to well an area is an optimum currency area. And one of them is that you want to have labor mobility. So what happens if a country is hit by a negative shock, uh, then if it cannot adjust the exchange rate, if it cannot set independent monetary policy, then one way of responding is to have movements. Um, labor moving away from a region hit by a negative shock to other countries that are in a boom. But, um, well, in theory, that should all work well in the European Monetary Union. After all, um, there's a single market with free movement of labor. This was set out in the Single European Act of 1986 and was realized, um, at least on paper, um, since 1992, the single market. But in practice, there are very important cultural and language barriers that impede the free movement of labor. So this doesn't work very well. This is in contrast to the United States. Uh, there are also massive differences in regions, but there's much more labor mobility. Then another uh, criteria, whether the euro area is an optimum currency area, is whether there is um, sufficient fiscal flexibility. Because if monetary policy cannot respond to an asymmetric country-specific shock, then you still have fiscal policy. 
So if a country has sufficient fiscal flexibility or if there are even transfers within the currency area going from states in a boom to states in a recession, then you would be able to smooth out those shocks and all would be well. And this is basically what we observe in the United States. So it's a federal system with quite some automatic stabilizers uh, moving funds across states, uh, for instance, through federal income taxes, unemployment benefits, and so on. Um, this is something that we do not observe in the euro area. Uh, so that is a problem. In fact, fiscal flexibility has been constrained, at least in theory, by the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, which was, implemented, was agreed on in 1997. And it limits the country's ability to implement expansionary fiscal policy. Uh, its budget deficit cannot be more than 3% of GDP. So rather than having more fiscal flexibility, it actually, in theory, was less fiscal flexibility. So then another issue is like um, it's important to have a lot of trade within the currency area. We do observe that in the euro area. And um, in fact, there, there was some hope um, when uh, the EMU was uh, founded that um, even though it was clearly not a perfect currency area, that it may become an optimum currency area over time. Uh, the European Commission expressed the hope that uh, with the elimination of uh, separate currencies, uh, no longer exchange rate risk and uncertainty, uh, there would be more trade, uh, countries would be more closely connected to each other, and um, as a result, um, they would become more in sync with each other. And what previously may have been quite desperate countries would be forced into a single currency area. Um, but even at the time, this view was criticized, um, most notably by Paul Krugman, and he argued exactly the opposite. He said, like, well, when you have more trade, then if you're living in a world where there are economies of scale, then production will specialize in certain regions to exploit these economies of scale and agglomeration effects. And as a result, sector-specific shocks become country-specific shocks, and you actually get more asymmetric shocks rather than less. So regions become more specialized, just as we see in the US, for instance. Uh, look at car industry in the Midwest, um, high-tech industry in Silicon Valley. Uh, so th those are good examples. So uh, Krugman was actually a pessimist and said that, you know, the story by the European Commission is just wishful thinking. Um, and um, so that's also what we have observed. Uh, the story of the European Commission uh, was wishful thinking. So there was no economic invisible hand that uh, would turn the euro area into an optimum currency area. So we shouldn't be surprised that we now see all these, um, you know, all these shocks and, and all, the, all the turmoil in the euro area. But if it wasn't for you know, the financial crisis, then the euro area probably, probably could have gone on for quite a while and hobbled along uh, without serious problems. Uh, but um, the financial crisis provided a shock and really put the, the system to, a, to a, you know, stress tested the system. And so uh, that's why it's now breaking apart and failing. Uh, so the question is, uh, what do we need to, to get this, the euro area to work? Now, uh, one thing is to go back to the criteria for optimum currency area. So we need um, sufficient fiscal flexibility, and um, that is something that has actually been further curtailed. Uh, part of the fiscal compact in response to the sovereign debt crisis was that, oh, we want to further reduce the flexibility that countries have, um, and as a result, they can you know, run even smaller budget deficits, exactly the opposite from what you should have. Yeah. And um, also, so basically what was going on is that, um, so disability and growth pact didn't work. Yeah. And um, one reason why it didn't work is because uh, the first country to violate it was Portugal, and there was some finger wagging. And the next two countries were France and Germany. And then, you know, they were not going to impose any fines on them. You know? So they got away with it, and then other countries like Greece realized that the Stability and Growth Pact has no teeth, and as a result, we can just completely ignore it. And they duly did. So in a way, it's quite hypocritical for Germany to now 
insist on Greece and Portugal sticking to the pact and even imposing a much stricter fiscal compact on them. Well, it was the Germans themselves that were violating the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, then it, it was not our benefit to do so. So um, this fiscal compact is really barking upon the wrong tree. This is not really the problem that is out there. Yeah. So what is the problem is uh, big differences in competitiveness, uh, and uh, that is something that will take much longer to, to work out and to improve. There have been many attempts to do so. Uh, so the Lisbon Treaty was a good example of that. Uh, but these were just like words, and they haven't been put into practice. And um, now, what we see right now in direct response to the financial crisis is in addition to the fiscal compact is now the, the idea that there should be a banking union. So that there should be a common banking supervisor in a euro area. Now, part of the problem that we see, especially in the periphery countries like Ireland and Spain, are directly related to the banking sector. Yeah. So it's poor financial supervision or very unfortunate uh, crisis measures that they took. Uh, that are causing the, the, the fiscal problems in these countries. And so you, it is a good idea to do something about banking supervision and regulation in the euro area, especially since you know, the initial responses were pretty dreadful. Uh, so when the European Banking Association came up with a stress tests, it was just a joke. You know, the stress scenario was just like the baseline forecast. It was absolutely not a proper stress test at all. And the banks, you know, they passed, most of them passed with flying colors, and many of them subsequently failed. You know, a great example after the second uh, set of stress tests was, um, um, say, um, you know, Dexia. So it was one of the, the banks coming out with, with very strongly out of the, the stress test. A couple of months later, it had to be bailed out by the Belgian, French, and Luxembourg government. I mean, so clearly, these stress tests were a ma major joke. Yeah. Um, so that was a big mistake that they made. Um, so to say now, OK, we need to have um, a banking union, then yes, that's a good idea. But if you just have like another organization like the EBA coming up with these you know, stress tests that aren't meaningful, then that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, so you really need to have much more rigorous supervision and regulation in the euro area to, to do something about it. So when we look at, um, you know, there was the, the hope that initially that there was an economic invisible hand that would turn the European Monetary Union in an optimum currency area. That hasn't materialized, and there was the hope that somehow politicians would get their act together, uh, but since now they would be forced to implement structural reforms. That hasn't happened either, and it's now with the financial crisis that politicians are suddenly faced with the consequences and are forced into measures, and some of which are just plainly misguided, like the fiscal compact. And some of them go in the right direction, uh, but maybe too little too late, like um, initiatives for a current European supervisor. So you, um, there are many challenges uh, ahead, and um, most of the problems actually are entirely self-inflicted when it comes to the euro area. They could easily have been prevented if policymakers had been more forward-looking and had um, just um, implemented the, the reforms that were needed. But hey, they're politicians, you know. If um, you can get long-term gains but short-term pain, they're not going to do it. And that's why we are in the current mess. Thank you very much, Petra. Um, second speaker will be Mark Littlewood. I'll hand over to Mark. Uh, well, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to, uh, to these three august societies to discuss this vexed and indeed controversial topic. So controversial, in fact, that no sooner we sat down than civil war seemed to have been breaking out uh, outside the, <laughs> these very walls. Uh, and uh, a particularly controversial and vexed subject for me personally, actually, uh, that going back uh, 15 or 20 years, I was a very staunch pro-European. Uh, I had uh, the honour, or somebody might now consider it to be the irreconcilable black mark on my CV of being the president of the UK branch of the Young European Federalists. 
uh, my first uh, job of uh, professional employment was to work for the European Movement, uh, which is a Europe-wide pro-European organisation arguing for closer union. And in particular, at the time, we argued, you know, we can't understand these ludicrous dinosaur British Eurosceptics who are suggesting that we should keep the pound sterling when this euro currency project is coming along. What could possibly go wrong? You know, why aren't we signing up for this early doors? So I don't know if I owe you a full-blown apology, but I sure as hell owe you an explanation. <laughs> um, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes saying, what do I think did go wrong? Uh, and if you like, was it uh, completely obvious from the outset that, that these things had to go wrong? Um, what should happen now? And then in a very discrete category from that, what I think will happen now? Well, I mean, what went wrong, in part, I think, was to do with the fact that the membership criteria of joining the single currency were frankly observed in the breach. The Maastricht Treaty uh, attempted, through some fairly rudimentary numbers it has to be said, but attempted to make sure that those joining were fiscally stable, moving towards balanced budget sort of countries. I don't think that that would guarantee that you would have an optimal currency area, but it seems to me that's the sort of uh, criteria that you would put down. Your budget deficit should be no more than 3%. Your debt to GDP ratio should no, be no more than 60%. These were fairly strict fiscally conservative rules that appealed actually to uh, classically liberal free market economists uh, on the continent. Uh, not so much, it has to be said, to those in the United Kingdom who were sceptical that the project would ever work and have been uh, effectively proven right by events. I believe I'm right in saying, I'm happy to be contradicted uh, on this, that the only Eurozone country that has consistently stuck to those Maastricht criteria is Luxembourg. Uh, this would have been a considerably smaller currency zone if we had rigorously enforced the Maastricht criteria. Luxembourg would indeed be using the Euro, but every other member would have been uh, expelled or not allowed in in the first place. Um, and, and the minute that exceptions were made, Belgium, for example, was allowed in despite having a very substantial national debt because it claimed it could prove it could service it. But uh, the Maastricht criteria can now be thrown into the dustbin of history. Uh, they are no more than an aspiration and have certainly not been enforced. Uh, and then to pick up um, Petra's point, which I, I agree substantially with, I think the hope at the time amongst economists of a, a free market persuasion was even if this wasn't the optimal currency zone, even if, yeah, okay, labour mobility isn't going to be as good in the European Union as it is in the United States where they have a shared language and say moving from Detroit to Los Angeles is people do at the drop of a hat, whereas perhaps moving from Madrid to Athens or from Athens to Berlin isn't as common a practice for language and cultural barriers. But nevertheless, by bringing this in, we will make those sort of things happen. So by having a single currency zone, actually even though labour mobility isn't great at the moment, it will soar. Um, uh, furthermore, that those countries who are, if you like, on the wrong side of the Maastricht criteria or not yet sufficiently showing sensible fiscal prudence at their government level will have to. And we will see, in addition to that, enormous sort of uh, uh, deregulation of the labour market so that even if people don't typically move from Athens to Berlin, um, what we would see will be that in Athens, yeah, real wages will fall. You know, the trade unions will just have to accept that the, uh, right, the price that you can secure for your labour will start to fall if you're less productive and less efficient. And I actually think in the, in the world of um, academic, academic economics, none of these things are wholly implausible. I mean, that, that, that there is a theoretical argument that they could have happened. But in the world of real politics, they transparently have not. Uh, so the political will has not been found to deal with what has been for a considerable period of time, if you were to take Greece, the structural weaknesses in their economy. And indeed, I would go so far as to say that in Greece, uh, civil society itself is now imperiled. 
And although it seems to me, from a, a point of view of a, I guess, pseudo-economist, that uh, it's pretty obvious what economic reforms are needed in Greece, absolutely crushing austerity, a default of at least 50% or more on their national debt, um, huge reductions in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in wages, uh, that it's all very well to write all this down in a pamphlet or a speech or a, an academic textbook, but the ability to bring that about in the real world is extremely low. So all of the perhaps fanciful theoretical hopes of the Eurozone have been uh, empirically thwarted by uh, a mixture of, uh, uh, of political and real economic factors. I'm still concerned, and I suppose this is the, if I'm trying to draw any ideological consistency between what I advocated in, uh, in the mid to late 90s and what I think now, I'm still concerned. I don't really like exchange rates as the means of dealing with shocks. They may be necessary. I might have to accept this as a second best solution. But consistently, in the United Kingdom at least, I feel that they've been used as a sleight of hand. Uh, that there are structural problems in our economy. Uh, uh, Harold Wilson, when he was actually able to just sort of set the price of sterling, said, right, we're going to devalue. The pound in your pocket is still worth exactly the same. That was a lie, by the way. It wasn't worth exactly the same. You couldn't buy anything like as many foreign goods and services as previously. And you ease the immediate pain through an exchange rate devaluation. And easing immediate pain is not a bad thing in economics. But sometimes, perhaps, it deflects the political authorities from actually addressing the underlying um, problems in their economy. I mean, it's worth noting for example, uh, although I would say an overwhelming majority of people are, uh, in the UK are delighted that sterling didn't join the euro, sterling has depreciated a lot against the euro since, since the launch, I mean very substantially. So we must be doing something fairly badly wrong here. Uh, what should happen? Um, what I think should happen is that we need to move to the orderly breakup of what is presently the Eurozone and the reconstruction of the European Union in a number of ways. Now, it does seem to me that arguing for the organised breakup of the Eurozone is a bit like arguing for an orderly hurricane um, or a quiet fireworks display. Uh, it's difficult to know how this, is, you know, how this can actually be uh, done and achieved. And I think one of the practical economic problems that people are grasping with is although I think virtually everybody can agree if we're presently in scenario A, that scenario A is somewhere between suboptimal and disastrous. And we might disagree about whether we want to get to scenario B, C, D, E or F. But piloting any way out of scenario A is extremely difficult. So it's easy to say as a throwaway line that Greece should leave the Eurozone. Yes, OK, well, how are you going to relaunch the drachma exactly? Uh, that requires quite a bit of work. Uh, you might be able to buy yourself a long weekend by doing it over a bank holiday weekend and closing the markets on the Tuesday, but four days to launch a new currency, that's a pretty tricky uh, suggestion, not just administratively. You would need to stop what is already huge capital flight away from Greece. You would probably literally need to have the military at the borders to stop money flowing out. These are not easy things to achieve. So even if you believe that that's the solution, the route there is extraordinarily difficult. My favoured solution would be not to relaunch the drachma, it would be to relaunch the Deutschmark. Uh, I think that you could potentially, I think it's easier to launch a new strong currency than it is to launch a new weak currency. And I think that the best way out of this would be that Germany double plus, including uh, the optimal currency area around Germany, we can argue whether that includes France or Italy or whether it only includes um, uh, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, but the, the optimal currency area around Germany would now have a new hard euro currency, call it what you will, it would basically be the Deutsche Mark, it would have to be named something else for political reasons, but that would be essentially what it would be. And the euro could continue to exist and indeed be used by the Greeks, the Portuguese and the Irish but would start to devalue rapidly, I would suggest, against that new hard currency that would then have very proper and strict rules about who should join it. What will happen, uh, almost certainly not, sadly, what I'm proposing, 
although given my record to date, you might think that that's a pretty good thing. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I can just about claim to be an economist, but I'm, I'm not an economic forecaster, really. But I would suggest that the position in the Eurozone is somewhere between uh, bleak and apocalyptic for what is likely to happen. Uh, I was asked at a conference a few weeks ago, given that, what would be your investment advice for the next few years? And I said, well, I'd probably invest all of my money in powdered milk and submachine guns, which are bound to improve on the, on the open market if things get as bad as I think. Uh, so I'm being a slightly cynical and slightly hysterical, but only slightly. I agree very much with Petra's analysis that there is a, 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 a kind of um, sense here that the Eurozone is, is acting, including principally the German government, who are the, the key actors here like a man slowly dying in quicksand and scrabbling around a bit rather than actually finding a full new strategy. And I think that that will continue. And I think that the political will, sadly, is there for that to continue for the foreseeable future. So I think that there will be, over coming weeks, months, possibly years, this just keep the show on the road approach. Um, of continual bailouts. Sooner or later that has to come to an end, but I fear it will be later. And eventually we will move perhaps to the sort of solution I want, a multi-tiered Europe and a multi-speed um, Europe. So sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings. Sorry to have got my predictions completely wrong 20, uh, 20 or so years ago. Uh, but I'll just leave you with the words of the very first director uh, of, of the IEA uh, who said, in the mid-1970s, when things looked extremely bleak in the United Kingdom economically, and people saying, where should we turn? What on earth could we, can we possibly do to get out of this mess? And his uh, advice to everybody was, cheer up. Things can only get worse. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Invitation. Thanks for having me. Um, We've had two excellent presentations so far. Uh, we've given a, been given a lot of background, which has been very helpful, I think. I agree with a lot of it. Um, and I won't go through, I want to try to answer the question how we got here, because I think that has been covered quite well already. Um, I would add, I think Europe as a, at the moment is facing uh, more than just a currency crisis. Uh, I think it's facing a bank debt and competitiveness crisis all at once. Uh, this in turn creates, this, these three crises create a political crisis which then reinforces the other three. I think that's why this is so complicated because uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit like one of those um, uh, you know, uh, multi-headed monsters. Once, when you cut off one head, immediately you have two more heads growing up, out. And I think that's what Europe is looking at at the moment, is fighting on multiple fronts. I totally endorse this point that policymakers weren't prepared for this. They were short-sighted. What I usually say about the euro is that, yes, in theory, it's not a bad idea to have a uh, single currency uh, for several countries. But the way the euro was constructed assumed that politicians and central bankers would make the right decisions all the time, which we know from history. Any system that has that as its foundation is bound to fail. So here we are. Um, now, I think one of the common themes or the recurring themes throughout this crisis is that uh, markets demand something of the Eurozone that national democracies cannot deliver. I think that's what we're looking at. Constantly, markets require a quick solution where, because the nature of national democracy is that it, it's, you know, it, it's, um, the Eurozone as a whole will have to move much lower. And I think that's what we've seen over and over again in the Eurozone. And that's what will continue to happen. Um, where we hear, where we talk about policymakers and politicians not doing the right thing, is because they are actually quite restricted in what they can do because of national democracy at home. Uh, Finland has constitutional concerns. Germany has constitutional problems at home. Uh, Spain is struggling with its own region, regional structure, um, where Madrid now has has problems controlling spending and and so forth in its own region. So. Because of the structure of national democracy, it's very difficult for the Eurozone as a whole, collectively, to act with the kind of swiftness that markets would require of them in order to keep this crisis in check. So where are we at now? Well, I think the Eurozone crisis and its current approach uh, is coming up against three limitations. 
um, and it's how these, to what extent these limitations can be stretched, which will determine, will, which will determine the fate, fate of the euro, and to what extent it will end up in tears, as, as I think Mark is predicting, or whether they can press ahead and move ahead with something a bit more sustainable. So three limitations, an economic limitation, and a constitutional limitation, and a political limitation. And I will quickly go through the three of them. Now, the economic limitation, I think, is in, in order to create a more sustainable currency area, an optimal currency area we can forget about. The Eurozone at 17 will never become an optimal currency area. But it can become a sustainable currency area. In order to create a sustainable currency area, there's a very popular thought out there that the Eurozone must move to some sort of fiscal union to compensate for the kind of internal imbalances and tensions that we have, that we heard about. Um, um, so you have a transfer going from the north to the south to compensate for the lack of competitiveness in the south. Now, I think that is coming up against a very, very severe economic limitations in that who will carry the eurozone. It's a bit like that super scene in one of the Superman movies when well, I think um, what's what's the woman? What's the woman's name in the Superman? Lois Lane. Lois Lane. Yes, Lois Lane. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have known that. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was, I was. Uh, I was not wanting to be the geeky one. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, so she is, uh, she's asking, you know, she's up flying there with Superman, and then uh, she's asking, so, so who got me? Are you sure you really got me? And Superman answers, well, I got you, don't worry. And uh, Lewis Lane responds, who got you? And I think that's very much where the uh, Eurozone is at. Germany, of course, got, is, is supposed to underwrite the Eurozone. That's the implicit understanding. But who got Germany? Who, who is having Germany? Germany is getting older. Germany has demographic trends against it. If you take contingent liabilities into account uh, within the German economy, then Germany is actually poorer than Italy. So if you take the pay-as-you-go pension system, the bailout funds, for example, to the Eurozone, then Germany's debt to GDP is higher than Italy's. Will Germany be, can Germany afford to underwrite the Eurozone? So I think there's an economic limitation to where the Eurozone can move. The second one is a constitutional limitation, where I think, as I mentioned before, because the way some of these national democracies are structured, they can only do so much within the limits of their constitutions. Again, if you think about Germany, there's a lot of, there are a lot of complaints about Germany being slow in the Eurozone crisis. Angela Merkel is not acting quickly enough. And usually that actually comes from Americans and the British, and the Anglo-Saxon world, which is most ironic, because the Americans in particular set Germany up specifically to be slow moving because they did not want to repeat the mistakes in the Weimar Republic. So for example, the, emerging, the executive emerging powers were removed in the post-World War II German constitution. You had a constitutional court being established that was supposed to serve as a circuit break on rash decision making. Germany was set up to be a slow moving actor. It's a federal state, it's very different. By the same people who now ask of it to sort of just uh, take a big leap towards more integration and underwrite the rest of the Eurozone. Because of constitutional constraints in a lot of member states, um, it will be very difficult for the Eurozone to, to continue on its current path. Um, the third limitation is political. And I think this is quite critical. Um, if you look at Southern Europe, um, the EU in Southern Europe used to be a very popular institution. It used, to, it used to be perceived as a, uh, a counterforce to quite flaky domestic politics. You know, it was a sort of a, a break from the past of you know, Franco in Spain, of the colonials in Greece. It was something positive. Support, trust in the EU in, in the Mediterranean countries have on average dropped from 55% a decade ago to 25% today. So from having been a very popular actor, uh, from these countries have been very pro-European instinctively. The EU is now being seen as not a particularly trusted institution. And I think that goes to show that if you push this too hard, these measures, then perhaps you will have a political backlash in some of these countries. And of course the same is true in Germany. 60-70% um, of Germans in opinion polls are against putting more cash on the table or against more fiscal integration. If fiscal integration means the Germans, Germans, Germans paying up. Um, and again, in Germany, you have a whole different tone now in the European debate. I mean, you have some of the leader pages in German press, and for German speakers here, I'm sure you've noticed it, 
uh, remind us almost of what you hear in the, Brit in the British press about Europe sometimes. I mean, Bill Zeitung, you know, the world's biggest tabloid, uh, has a f is having a field day. Uh, its front pages are frequently filled with sort of anti-euro, or at least anti-bailout headlines. So this political limitation of the Euro project is, is now, coming to, uh, it's come, now coming to the fore in a very conspicuous way. And, and you wonder how far you can push that before electorates in these various member states say we won't have it anymore. And I think this is where the point about internal devaluation comes, becomes very important. Because as has been rightly noted, um, uh, these countries, the 17 Eurozone countries cannot use their currency to to absorb shocks, to pursue competitive evaluations, uh, and to align their economies more, to align their currency more, more to the strength of their economy. I mean, it, I agree, it can be a very good thing that you don't have the opportunity to devalue in order to make your uh, economy more competitive through structural reform, labor market reform, and so forth. But for some of these countries, they're, in, they're in a stuck in a very tricky position because they have to continue to cut wages at home you know, continue to reform at home and just continue to go back to the population for more and more and more. Uh, again, it can be a great thing if they actually manage to, if they, if they can manage to see it through. But if you look at where these countries are in terms of their, their competitive value, uh, sorry, the internal devaluation needed to become competitive with Germany, a lot of them have a hell of a lot of long way to go. So if you look at Spain, for example, which already has a lot of political problems at home, they have achieved roughly 50% of their schedule internal devaluation before they can become competitive with Germany inside the currency union. Greece is not even close. They're so far away from becoming competitive with Germany inside the euro uh, that you wonder you know, how, far, how, more, how, far, how much further they can go. Uh, Portugal is putting in heroic effort but still has a very long way to go. Italy doesn't have that long way of go, to go but has barely started. So all these countries have to continue to cut domestically pursue internal devaluation if they want to stay inside the Eurozone. The only country that looks a, has a more optimistic outlook is Ireland that has achieved the kind of internal devaluation needed to become competitive inside the currency. So they're looking quite good. So these, I think we're looking at uh, three quite serious limitations to where the Eurozone um, can go next. And we don't know exactly how this will play out. We don't know if, for example, the Spanish electorate will accept more austerity. We don't know if the Greece electorate can accept more austerity. I mean, it's already, already looking pretty tough there. So just quickly about what's going to happen next. Now, in terms of Greece, I think Berlin has concluded that there's no way you can push Greece outside out of the euro as long as Spain is looking the way it's looking. So I think Germany will, will try to keep Greece inside the eurozone at, at least until the German elections in 2013. Um, at the same time, they will try to get Spain in order. I, I suspect that Spain will try to seek a bailout package at the end of this year or early next year. They will try to postpone it as much as possible. And the hope is that Spain can continue with internal devaluation, get its banking system in order, and stabilize the situation to such an extent that perhaps, eventually, you can shave off Greece. Um, and I think the Germans are quite keen on this idea that eventually Greece has to go. Because not only because of the economic reasons that you mentioned, Mark, but also because Greece at the moment, uh, viewed from Berlin, is a political obstacle to achieve a sustainable euro. Because there's so little trust between Berlin and Athens, it's very difficult for Germany to sell the kind of measures that are needed to keep the eurozone together as long as Greece is inside the currency union. So I think there is an economic rationale, but also a very strong political rationale for, from Germany that sooner or later Greece has to go. But that won't happen before the uh, German elections in 2013. Now, in terms of how you split up a currency union, now, I, I agree that ec economically the best option will be for Germany to leave from the top. I agree with you on that mark. I'm not necessarily advocating it, but I think if you split up the currency union, that will be the best way of doing it. Um, I do think, though, that this idea of a southern euro uh, will be difficult to sustain because as soon as Germany leaves, there will be no southern euro. I mean, who, who will underwrite it? Will there be a strong central bank there to back it up? Uh, which investors, who want to keep their uh, money in the Mediterranean uh, euro uh, when the stronger countries have left? So I think it will be very difficult to sustain that southern euro, but you certainly can have a strong sort of uh, whatever you want to call the uh, I've heard nor euro, the northern euro, uh, D mark plus, you know, uh, uh, so forth and so on. Um, I mean, that's fully possible. Um, 
I do think, however, that it's possible to shave off Greece from the bottom as well, but nothing, no more country, possibly Portugal. But if you shave off Greece from the bottom, uh, when Greece has a primary surplus so that it can run a day-to-day -day business and when its banking system is recapitalized and uh, consolidated, then I think it can shave off Greece if it coincides when, when the uh, Spanish banking system in, in particular is in more solid shape. Again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but I think it's possible. But this idea that you can have a full spill of the, bank, of, of the currency union with Spain and Italy leaving, I think it's fiction. Uh, then you would, you would see a return to uh, 1929, if not worse. So it would have to be either Germany from the top and then accept that you know, the southern economies will have to go back to their own currencies, or it would have to be Greece and possibly Portugal from the bottom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mats. And I'll finally hand over to Ray. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's very interesting to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm probably the only person here old enough to have voted against the UK's membership of the European <laughs> Union in 1973. Now, we all learn things as we go along, and I probably have changed my mind. And I've learned a lot about Europe in that time as well. Um, one of the things I've, I've learned about Europe is one has to listen to what Europeans are saying as well as what Americans are saying. <laughs> And Europeans sometimes are playing rather longer and more complicated games than I think many American and American-influenced academics recognize. Uh, one has to make a distinction, for instance, between million liberalism, that's utilitarianism where you maximize and do things instantly and change all the time, and German ordo-liberalism, where a German ordo-liberalism, which is a, a philosophical set of concepts that come out of Kant, among others, is that one should maximise in relation to the constraints society puts on you, and the constraints are at least as important as the maximisation. So the rule-guided action that's behind much of what we've seen in, in Europe is very important, and rule-guided action makes you play much longer games. There are rules there that you mustn't break, and you're trying to construct things. And I think we have to bear that in mind when we look at what's happening now in the Euro area. Why do we see a Euro area? Well. Fifty years ago, some Europeans wanted to change Europe. They wanted to change it in two ways. The first is that they wanted to construct a Europe that would no longer fight within itself. To make it sufficiently integrated, it was a safe place to live in. Remember that 50 years ago, we'd come out, just come out of 350 years of wars between Germany and France. In virtually continuous wars between them. There were some short periods of peace. Um, so first of all, there's a desire to construct an integrated Europe that's bound in such a way that we can no longer destroy ourselves, and that includes us. The second thing that those Europeans had in mind, and there were many of them, was that we needed to think about the single market because it was quite clear one of the reasons why the Americans were so politically powerful is although they were an economy of a similar size to Europe, they operated with a single market, and therefore they gained economies of scale, they gained economies in terms of the effectiveness of competition. They gained economies in terms of regulation. So the objective of many European politicians over the last 50 years has to been to create something a bit like the US so that there's a large market with no barriers. Now, that market's not necessarily going to be identical to the US. There's much more emphasis on the role of rules and regulations in Europe than there is in the US. But that, that's the objective. Now, where did... You know, the monetary union come in. Well, we saw a movement from a common market to a single market. The single market was introduced in the 1980s. I remember being a civil servant in the UK Treasury in 1986, and my director came in and said to me, Ray, what's this about the single market program? Have we signed it? What's it going to do? This was after Margaret Thatcher had signed the treaty. The UK Treasury didn't know that we just signed the most fundamental transformation of the way our economy would behave uh, in the next, for the next 20 years. The single market was the removal of barriers to competition, the removal of barriers to trade, to the movement of labour, but mainly competition. The labour mobility and the other things were in some sense aside. And many Europeans correctly thought, or correctly in some people's opinion, not everybody, that the removal of the currency barrier was also one of the things that the Americans had enormously gained from. The existence of separate currencies within Europe was a barrier to trade and efficiency. And therefore, it was argued we had to move, like the Americans, to having a common currency to improve efficiency, to improve competition, to raise our output towards American standards. Now, that, that was an objective, and they had read 
Mundell's paper on an optimal currency area. It's very interesting. If in the 1960s you write a paper on the optimal currency area and get it published, it sounds great. You send that paper off to a journal now and you say, look, it says optimal currency area in the title. Where's the optimization? This looks like a bundle of vaguely plausible reasons why countries might hang together. It's not a theory. It's vaguely plausible. Monetary unions can work for all sorts of reasons. For instance, think of a common currency area that produced the most rapid rate of growth in the advanced economies ever. When was that? That was the common currency area of the Bretton Woods when we had fixed exchange rates, one monetary policy authority, which was the US, and for 25 years, very rapid growth rates. That went with two very interesting things, though. First of all, extremely limited financial liberalization within countries and extremely limited financial liberalization between countries. Now, it's very interesting to think about that because what did the, especially German thinkers, but also British thinkers, I'm sure you can all remember now people saying we must have light touch regulation in our financial system in order to enhance growth. I've seen politicians say it. I've seen UK prime ministers say it. I've seen German prime ministers say it. Uh, probably whatever they're called, Ger Chancellor. German chancellors. No, say it. Um, at the point of the formation of the single market in the early 1990s, the economics profession had persuaded the world that financial liberalization was extremely good for it. So the single market was to be topped off by a currency area and financial liberalization, removing all barriers to movement of capital between countries and competition across them. Now, the problem we've seen in Europe is not that we set up a monetary union, not that we set up a financial market that where we had competition across borders with one market and 39 regulators, and it's not that we set up a system to back those up where there were no fiscal agreements that would work, it's that we did all of them together that we had a single currency for some of the countries, we had a financial regulation system that was completely incoherent, and we had no fiscal backup for it. And the fiscal backup is not for the transfer to the poor countries. The poor countries, if they wish to be poor, in my opinion, it's entirely their own choice to be poor. The fiscal union has to be there because if you have a banking system where you have a single market, regularly bankers make stupid mistakes and go bankrupt. And at that point, the only group that can save the economy is the fiscal authorities or the fiscal authority. Now, if you have one country, one financial market, one fiscal authority, it's known that the fiscal authority can step in and actually solve the problem. If you have one market, 27 countries and 39 regulators, then it's not at all clear what's going to happen. Now, Far enough, the financial crisis emanated from the US, where the ideology also came from of light touch regulation. But we were at least as much to blame in Europe about not having the structures in, in place to deal with it. So we have a problem in Europe because we had a financial crisis without the institutional structure in place to deal with it, which is not just the existence of the Eurozone. Separate currencies wouldn't have helped us. We were outside the Eurozone. We had a financial crisis worse than the others. Now, that's only because we had chosen to be the financial center for the Eurozone. So our financial assets were seven times our GDP, which was much larger than anybody else's in the Eurozone except Luxembourg and Iceland. So we took on a lot more of the risks. But if we go forward, we have to think, what did we do wrong? We set up a common currency area. We set up a single market in financial services that did not cover the same area. And we set up a, set a regulator or set of regulators who didn't cover either the Eurozone or the market and financial services. So going forward, we have to see some sort of realignment in Europe of the spheres of influence. It is reasonably clear that one should see a coincidence of the area of authority of the monetary authority the area of authority of the financial regulator and the area of authority of the fiscal structure. You don't have to have one fiscal authority, but going forward, if we are to see the Eurozone continue, and it's a political, not an economic construct, then European politicians have to start to agree how they're going to put in place the three things they need. A monetary authority that works. Now, that monetary authority with 
what's it called, endless monetary policy or, open, uh, or whatever, the new policy of buying government bonds is not what you need. You only need a monetary policy dealing with the banking system in a liquidity crisis. We face a, f a solvency crisis in Europe. Banks do not have enough money. Banks in Spain, banks in other countries are bankrupt. Somebody needs to shove some money into them to keep them afloat. That can only be the state. So we need a monetary policy authority that works with reasonable process along, or, or down that process. We need a regulatory th authority that coincides with the monetary authority, although it could actually coincide with the market. Now, if it coincides with the monetary authority, which makes sense, the UK is outside the regulation framework. Why do we see so many people in the City of London saying, Eurozone will fall to pieces next week? Well, the reason they want to say that is because if it doesn't, London will become a trivial and peripheral financial centre. If they can't talk it down, their salaries go down. So they keep on talking it down. But I suspect we're going to see a strong European financial regulator and a trivial financial centre in London, which doesn't worry me too much. We will also see, but then we see a very slow process in getting there, of some sort of fiscal agreement in Europe. Now, remember being asked a year ago by the Financial Times, what were my views on this and that? What were the chances of the single, uh, the single currency still existing in a year's time? What was the chance of anybody exiting? I said it in December, January, on no basis whatsoever. As Kahneman says, people make random comments with no evidence. My random comment was I think there's a 10% chance that the Greeks might leave by the end of the year. Now, everybody else who answered this question there from the City of London said 40% chance of all complete collapse. Well, partly they wanted to talk it down. I had no idea. But what I did also say is we have a very slow process of political negotiation going on in Europe, which could take at least two years to reconstruct the institutions. And the two institutions that need completely restructuring are financial regulation and the fiscal agreements to back up the banking system. Not fiscal agreements that transfer money between countries, but the fiscal agreements that say when the banking system in Spain goes down, the Germans pay 32%, the French pay 22%, the Spaniards pay pay 10%. The reason for that is the banking system is a European problem and therefore the fiscal backup has to be a European thing and you have to have a binding fiscal treaty to back up bank solvency. All the other things don't matter but the banking system must be backed up. Now the reason the Germans are backing off from this is they're saying but look we're willing to say that going forward but we can't give you the backward guarantee because that will give you the incentive to do it again. You should have looked after your savings banks. You should have listened to the governor of your central bank who was saying to you, this system is rotten, it's falling to pieces. You should have done something about it earlier, therefore your taxpayers have to pay. Now, there will be some negotiation. Um, probably, and one must always make probabilistic statements, the German taxpayer will end up doing a bit of a bailout for the Spaniards, a bit more of a bailout for the Irish because it was a bit more of a European problem. They're already paying a lot for the Greeks. They will probably do it, but it's a slow process of getting the institutions in place, making sure that the people who made the mistakes, Greek politicians, Greek citizens, uh, other people, know that if they do it again, there will be punishments involved. It's not, oh dear, you've just fallen off the cliff, here's some money. You can continue to retire at 55 in Greece. You can continue to have a completely ludicrous fiscal system going forward that you will go bankrupt. Things have to change, and if they don't change, people may drop out. There's a negotiation process going on. I actually thought the Germans would be a bit tougher. They thought they'd turn up and say, well, we'll have the Port of Piraeus. The British can have the Ionian Islands. We will dismember your state. No. But the Germans have been very soft. The Ionian Islands, by the way, were British until 1867, if you didn't know. Um, so, so we would get them back. I think that the Greeks have been treated very gently indeed. Perhaps we shouldn't be forcing too rapid a fiscal change on anybody at the minute. It's the commitments to the future, like privatisation, like pension systems, that need to change. Why do I think it probably will work? Well, it's a political comment. The European Monetary Union and the European single market are political constructs to achieve something. Um, there are the two things to say about it. The first is said earlier, this is the longest period of peace between France and Germany since 1613. The second thing to say about it, when I'm asked by politicians and others in peripheral countries in the Eurozone and elsewhere, why should we be in monetary union? The answer to that 
is it's better than having your country invaded by the Germans again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, we now have 20 minutes for questions, so I'm going to take questions in groups of three, so we have um, a, a wide range of questions, and then we'll give over to the panel to answer whichever questions particularly take their fancy. So anyone want to ask any questions? Nobody. Oh, there's a question over here. Well, we'll start with you then. Is that on? Yes, I think. Um, I was just asking about the sort of uh, sovereignty element of what we've been, what you've been discussing, and the sort of political precursors, because as Ray explained, um, a lot of what's getting in the way here at the moment is just that. Um, is there a problem? Um, it is that um, you, you know all of Europe is the home of the nation state, the, where where the nation state came from, and we can't get rid of that. So my question is, in light of contingent sovereignty being introduced gradually by the UN through responsibility to protect and you know, through humanitarian incentives, do you think once people start to accept that sovereignty is perhaps not what it used to be, do you think that's going to be the step that allows a kind of unified fiscal policy and that allows the whole of the EU to kind of harmonise other elements of its policy making? Anyone's welcome to jump in on that one? The, the, the current concept of the state is sometimes called the Westphalian state. It's the concept of the sovereign state that came from the Treaty of Westphalia, which I think was in 1740 something? 1648. 1648. 1648. It's not that old. And we should be able to think of new concepts that are more flexible, that are more dimensions to the architecture than, than we currently have. So we could redesign the state. You know, what we perhaps need for Europe, and I could never write them, is a new Federalist Papers. Many, many people have said this. The Federalist Papers were the foundation of the American Constitution. They were a, a design, an agreement between the states and the sovereign that would work. Well, we need a set of new so uh, Federalist Papers for Europe, where certain domains are for the country, certain domains are for the higher level of authority. We have a problem that not everybody wants to accept all the dimensions of the higher level of authority. Now, some members of my party, I'm a member of the Labour Party still, have been since 1969, some members of my party are currently saying that given the changes in the design of Europe, we should leave. No, we should find a compromise. If we wish to say outside monetary union, which may be wise, then we should find a compromise and design a role for our state in relation to their states. It can be done. Geometry can be changed. I think there's some arguing about sovereignty. Some, I mean, so sovereignty isn't like virginity. It's not something you've either got or you haven't. Um, it's just simply not as black and white as that. You know, you, you, the United Kingdom government has certain levers it can pull and certain things it can do to change things in the United Kingdom, but is at the mercy of events outside. You know, clearly, if the Eurozone goes pop, that is going to have a substantially negative effect on the economy of the United Kingdom, even if every decision made by our government was absolutely the optimal one. And um, my, my fear is this. I think the point's right that there's a kind of variable geometry being demanded, which makes it difficult to write the Federalist Papers in a way that 27 member states or more would sign up to. Um, you know, the USA got there eventually, but after an almighty bloody civil war. Um, and I think the problem's this, basically. It's, it's uh, a question of cultural identity. And the issue comes down to, you know, effectively people from Cambridge seem to be willing to bail out Merseyside, but probably aren't willing to bail out um, Athens. Uh, that just seems to be a, you know, a, a, a rough thumb suck where the um, loyalties of individual men and women are. And when those loyalties are tested, as Max is sort of pointing out, you, you get a serious diminution in the respect given to these high authorities by the wider population, not just amongst necessarily the political classes, who still seem to be uh, pretty strongly pro-EU, but certainly by the wider population. And to that extent, I think that the, the, the practical truth of the matter is, to some degree, the convoy has to move at the speed of the slowest. And an attempt to do anything much different from that 
risks, political upheaval, resentment, um, racism, quite possibly, and uh, conceivably even civil war. And I'm not wholly persuaded that the reason that there has not been war between France and Germany since 1945 is entirely down to the construction of the European Union. Until very recently, it was true that no two countries had ever gone to war if they both had a McDonald's restaurant in but I'm not sure that I would necessarily make Ronald McDonald my peace envoy across the planet either. So it, uh, I think it may actually turn out to be the other way around. That when you get peace, you tend to get countries coming together and uniting, rather than, if you like, forcing or artificially uniting countries brings about peace. I think there could be a, a real difference in cause and effect, and I suspect that that's what's actually happened in the European Union. Well, I sort of agree to, at one level that in order for the Eurozone to really become sustainable long term, you have to basically rewrite the Westphalian order. I agree with that. You have to redefine the concept of, of the nation state in many ways. Because the difference now uh, compared to before when it comes to European integration is that in the past, sovereignty was, was transferred from individual countries to the EU level in areas such as regulation, the single market, the institutions, the boring stuff, you know, the stuff that is quite invisible. Yes, there were some national debates about associated with referenda and so forth, but really it, did, it was primarily about quite, for most people, obscure stuff. What the Eurozone crisis has done is that it has put the issue of sovereignty and European integration at the heart of national democracy, it now touches taxation and spending, which is what national elections are fought over. So therefore, and that's what I was trying to point out in my three limitations, the stakes are so much higher now. So both in creditor and debtor countries, European integration for the first time comes with a very visible price tag. So therefore, it's much more unpredictable uh, what the outcome of this very dynamic debate will be. But I will, I'll just make a couple of quick points. Um, this idea about a, a bank, a sort of a joint backstop for banks, yes, of course it's true. And I think what you were referring to was the European Stability Mechanism, which uh, is meant one of the Eurozone bailout funds contains about 500 billion euros. Uh, that is supposed to go in and directly recapitalize banks, Spanish banks. I mean, that's the holy grail, what everyone is working towards. Of course, that is only 500 billion euros. I mean, eventually that will run dry, so you still haven't answered the question, what happens after that? But that is basically the short-term question. What will the Germans demand in return for that happening? But that links to a much wider discussion. Because in order to get where the Eurozone is heading next and your sovereignty question, to what extent countries are willing to compromise on sovereignty, it's important to understand the sequencing. Berlin has one demand in order to press ahead with underwriting the Eurozone, either via banking union, which is fiscal union by the back door, or through transfers or debt pooling. And that is, we want oversight powers. We want an effective veto over your budgets, or we want to be able to see you, take you to court if you violate under spending rules. Conversely, they want very strict oversight powers over other countries' banks. That's what they want. That, in, com, that entails such a huge dent into national sovereignty that it's questionable whether countries will accept that on the other side of the bargain, including Spain. But that is what the Germans demand. You know? So you have a sequence of problem because the French even, they want the opposite order. They say solidarity before supervision. You know? So you're stuck in that catch-22 moment precisely because what's very important for Germany to, sovereign, to safeguard its budgetary sovereignty, the Bundestag budgetary sovereignty, is clashing with what is needed in, order in Spain and France and elsewhere to safeguard their uh, national sovereignty. And I think that is the clash of national democracy that we witness in front of us. So yes, it's easy to say that we should press ahead with some of these measures. You know, we should have a banking union. You know, we should have overlapping structures. But in reality, national democracy is a very powerful force that is difficult to just wish away. So I think we have a very long way ahead of us before we can move post in a post-sovereignty age. And two years to achieve a banking union, absolutely no way. Not even close. Come so you, back to me in a decade. I didn't say to achieve it. I yeah. said to begin to write things on pieces of paper. Yeah, I, I, they just, <laughs> in, in the resolution directive, which is, involves basic cross-border lending to some extent between banking systems, they already dropped that from the commission proposal. How much more difficult would it be to create a kind of joint and several liability system for, bank, for, for, for joint bank stop that you're talking about? I think they're so far away from that at the moment. 
That may change after the German elections, but, you know, not for now. Thanks very much. Do we have another question at all? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll take you first, and then the one in the middle here, if we can get a microphone to him Can well. you hear me? Yeah, good. Yes. Right. Our gentleman here from the Treasury mentioned something from the 1970s. I'd like to mention something. The 1977 Earth Summit, from which was produced the beginnings of the Agenda 21 document. The Agenda 21 document says that nobody on the planet should be suffering. And what's happening in banking, what's happening economically, we're talking about countries as a whole, people are dying. Um, and we'll have the one in the middle as well, yeah. and then the one in the white shirt at the back. I was wondering, none of you actually mentioned European Central Bank explicitly. I was thinking about what do you think is the European Central Bank's role in that system? Because it's not really the same as the European Central Bank's role in that system. What do you think about the is it called monetary transactions program? The outright monetary transactions. Where it, yeah. Yeah, it actually uh, unlimitedly buys government bonds from the big countries. And I was wondering. Do you think it's actually good if it has driven down uh, bond rates? And it's looking quite okay, but you actually didn't mention it, so I was thinking about what you actually think about it. Thanks. And then thank you, and we'll take the one in the white shirt at the back. Uh, my question is very simple. It's simply, what role do you think um, other non-EU uh, and non-North American state or economic actors can play in uh, defining the role of the EU in the future, if any? Thanks. So, would you like to start, Petra? Yeah, so I'll start with the question on uh, the ECB and uh, the outright monetary transactions. Now, so the ECB, um, and this is really shouldn't be underestimated. So I'm, I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as, as Mark and Matt are that you know that there's going to be a breakup because you should not underestimate the vested interest that the ECB has in the euro area. Without the euro area, there is no ECB. Yes, so they will do whatever it takes to prevent the euro area from, at least the euro from disappearing. There may be some breakup, but they will try everything they can uh, to make sure that this is not gonna go out of control. Because their own very existence is at stake. Yeah? Now, when it comes to the outright monetary transactions, um, the, the name um, is very interesting, but completely misleading, actually. And I think it is a big mistake uh, to name it that way. But the program itself is actually much better than the one preceding it, uh, which was the securities markets program. That was really you know, poorly thought through. Uh, they just started buying these bonds um, for dubious reasons. Uh, it didn't really make much sense. They claimed that, oh, it's important for euro area transmission. Um, and yet, you know, they were intervening and buying Greek bonds, whereas like, Greece is really a tiny part of the euro area. Definitely does not have a significant effect on euro area monetary policy transmission. Uh, the program was also poorly thought through because they always said, like, you know, um, it's limited limited, um, they were clearly very reluctant to do it. It was completely wrongly set up. So from those points of view, the outright monetary transactions are a major improvement because the ECB actually has set, um, in principle, unlimited amount. You know? um, now, um, what is interesting is, like, as I mentioned, the name is actually completely misleading and very unfortunate. Um, so it says outright monetary transaction, which suggests that um, you buy and hold, and you're not going to reverse the de decision. Well, that's actually what was part of the securities markets program. Uh, but the outright monetary transactions, the ECB has said, can in principle be reversed. Uh, so you, you buy bonds, um, you know, and they're distressed, and when things are fine again, then you sell them again. So in that sense, it's not that outright as suggested by the name. Then the other part of the name, monetary transaction, that suggests that you're creating money, 
Yeah. Um, but it isn't. So the ECB has indicated that all these outright monetary transactions are going to be sterilized. So any money that gets injected into the euro area by buying these bonds is going to be absorbed again by another transaction. So essentially what you're going to see is that um, Spanish, Italian, Greek bonds being bought up um, and then instead, you know, in exchange for, for German bonds to neutralize the transaction on the money supply. Uh, so this is not monetary financing of government debt. Yeah? And the sterilization, by the way, is the same as took place for the securities markets program. Now, when we're talking about unlimited amounts, uh, then it is not trivial to pull that off. There have been some glitches uh, for the securities markets program to get the sterilization complete. But um, the, an outright monetary transaction, the program of the ECB actually does not involve monetary financing of government debt. So the whole name is extremely unfortunate because the Germans, of course, as soon as they hear about outright monetary transactions, they think about, oh my God, we're going to end up like Zimbabwe. You know, this is monetary financing of government debt. Uh, this is just going to be another like, you know, hyperinflation as Germany has experienced so painfully in the past. So this whole name is incredibly unfortunate. So I would say the outright monetary transactions, the program on, on its own is a major improvement and can definitely be credited for having reduced significantly uh, bonds, bond yields for both Spain and Italy. Um, but the terminology, the naming is incredibly unfortunate and um, so it's acted like a red flag for the Germans and that's why they're so, they're so strongly against it. Because so I think um, if they had come up with a, a better name then uh, the backlash wouldn't have been nearly as bad. Can I say something on the first question? I'll say something on all three but it'd be very brief. Uh, sometimes we have to distinguish between what's in the newspapers and taking up a lot of time for the chattering classes and what's important. Um, probably the European Union has increased output in its members by about 3% over the last 30 years. Probably monetary union will eventually raise output in its core members, Germany, France, Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, by 2% at best. That's a 5% gain in output. It's nice, but it's not important. But what might be much more important is if we actually spent a lot more of our time thinking about development issues, which I think was partly what you were referring to. There are far more important issues in the world, to be honest, than whether the Eurozone survives or not. If it doesn't survive, most of the members won't even notice it's gone. The Greeks will suffer, but they'll suffer anyway. Um, so we have to think what's important. We also have to think all the stuff in the newspapers is about the outright monetary transactions. What matters for the banking system and fiscal solvency is somebody stepping in with some, not cash, but assets. You don't need to print money to deal with the, the, the debt problem of the Spanish banks and the Spanish government. Somebody needs to lend them actual money. We haven't got around to that yet, but it isn't discussed very much. And in terms of outsiders, lots of people say we can help you. Well, th th there's not actually much to do. The Europeans have got to get around to agreeing with themselves what to do. It will eventually happen or they will fall apart. The world will continue. Germany will continue to be a wealthy country. Greece may be poorer than it was. But then if in Greece you were having had a balance of payments deficit of 15% of GDP, that means you were consuming 15% more than you were producing. When somebody requires you to stop having a balance of payments deficit, you have to consume 15% less. It's awfully painful, but it's almost inevitable that if you're consuming more than you produce, at some point or other, you've got to actually consume less than you produce to pay the money back. So, yes, these things are there, but they're not very important. I'm sorry to say that. I was asked to talk about monetary union, so I did. <laughs> um, just to come in on the, on the first point that the lady raised up, says I'm not familiar with the details, but I, I'm pretty sceptical about all documents signed by governments. And if in the 1970s... <laughs> I must clarify, so the agenda 21 document, the agenda for change the 21st century. I'm the agenda for change document. If, if government signed this document promising an end to human suffering, uh, then I'm even more sceptical about that document than I am about most documents that are signed. Um, uh, by governments. That would have been a promise and a pledge that could not possibly have been 
met. But just as I got this point about, you know, does it matter that much? I mean, clearly it does matter. But, I mean, it is worth, despite my sort of cynicism and pessimism, putting these things into context, I mean, you know, most likely, even with relatively sluggish growth, by the time of the next general election, the United Kingdom will be richer than it has ever been in its history. Uh, we haven't yet managed to bounce back to where we were before the banking crash, but we, sh uh, we, we, we will do, if not by 2015, shortly thereafter. There is some evidence that the economy is growing again. I mean, it's not all bad. It's pretty bad if you're Greece, right? Their GDP has gone backwards 25%. Um, us more or less flatlining or growing a bit is nirvana in comparison. Um, you mentioned the balance of payments situation. I think it's all, it is also worth mentioning the debt situation, uh, especially in the context of the 2008 financial crash. Uh, I'm rather with Warren Buffett on this one. He said, you know, when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming with no clothes on. And that was the uh, truth of the matter of what happened in the financial crash. That's not to absolve the banking industry of everything that happened, far from it. But uh, it was hardly the case that uh, a good number of countries in Western Europe were in a robust position to weather the storm. And if you continue to pursue a policy which has been fairly consistently pursued by Western European countries of governments spending year on year more and more money than they are bringing in, and indeed uh, taking on potentially colossal liabilities, the, you know, if we really are going to keep the National Health Service as cradle to grave and provide social care and state pensions and public sector pensions for people who are living longer and longer. At some point, this is unsustainable. We have riddled ourselves with debt. I mean, if, if spending huge amounts of money that you don't have was a smart government policy, Greece would be bailing out Germany, not the other way around. The Greeks have spent colossal amounts of money and assumed vast liabilities far, far beyond their means. And whilst I don't wish any human suffering on any, anybody, they are now paying the price for that. And this tails in a bit to the question about what can the rest of the world do, if you like. Well, in, in large part, set a better example. And, or, I mean, they are setting a good example in some cases. It seems to me, and this is, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to write down these numbers in blood, but it seems to me that there is good empirical evidence that if you want to be a fast-growing economy, you need to keep your state sector, the proportion of national income run by the government, to somewhere around 25% of GDP, there or thereabouts. If you want to go above that for other reasons, that's fine, uh, but you may well start to impinge upon the entrepreneurialism of your economy. And those fastest growing countries in the world at the moment, if you like economic growth, which I do like, are typically uh, retaining a public sector of around about 20% or so of GDP. I think it's 22% in so-called communist China. Uh, we in the United Kingdom, in our wisdom, have decided to spend, and this is typical across Europe, somewhere in the high 40s, on some measurement, we got to about 50% a couple of years ago. 50p in every pound is government spending. Uh, by way of comparison, as far as we can work out the archaeological statistics, the proportion of national income spent by the government in the former Soviet Union was about 70%. So we have chosen to position ourselves closer to the Soviet Union in terms of the proportion of the economy governed by the state than we have to the most successful and fastest growing countries on planet Earth. That to me seems exceedingly dim and very short-sighted. But the longer political struggle of persuading people that the state should be substantially smaller than it is at the moment, when I'm talking about cutting it by at least a third and possibly as much as a half, requires a uh, large number of adjustments to which I don't think either the political classes of Western Europe have addressed themselves and partly because, of, as a consequence of that, neither of the populations. I'll take a final comment from Max. Yeah, just on the ECB question, because I think that, I think that question was excellent. Um, I, I think the, um, uh, the ECB is now in the spotlight. Uh, and the, in one sense, uh, there's a bit of sort of battle about, uh, about the heart and soul of the ECB. The Germans were always 
uh, under the impression, at least the German electorate, part, large part of the economic class, large part of the legal class, they were always under the impression that the ECB would never, never become the Eurozone's lender of last resort. Uh, that would never be the case. Uh, it will, the ECB will be the Bundesbank sort of uh, heir, you know, somebody who's heir, someone who come after the Bundesbank, a sort of sister organization to the Bundesbank. It didn't quite turn out like that. Uh, so therefore, it's very interesting to look at the ECB and to what extent the Germans will accept turning the ECB into land of last resort, and so that it becomes that backstop for both banks and governments. On the OMT program, um, I think it's very interesting because it was a pretty clever thing to do, obviously, and I think Draghi did a very good job of selling it, uh, minus the name, uh, which I agree to. It wasn't necessarily the most, perhaps the most clever uh, name for it in Germany. Um, but uh, it, was, it was quite a clever thing. So what the OMT will do is basically, uh, it, it says it commits the ECB to buy unlimited short-term debt, so one to three year debt. Um, so it can step in at any point in time if borrowing costs goes, go, go up drastically, in, particularly in Spain and Italy, then the ECB just steps in, buys short-term debt and brings down the borrowing costs. That's the idea behind it, right? So, and and that is very attractive, not least to bankers and Anglo-Saxons, because that's using cheap liquidity from a central bank. Uh, and the central bank, in theory, can expand its balance sheet massively uh, to stem a crisis. So therefore, you don't have to take short-term losses. It's very attractive, both politicians and for bankers, for different reasons, but uh, uh, they both support it. So in principle, that's a good thing, right? So, because it brings borrowing costs down and it helps Spain. Now, there are two catches to that. The first catch is it still is a political decision because the OMT, the, the, in order to get on the OMT, in order to be able to tap the OMT, a government has to be on a bailout program from the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, which is government run. So, so the ECB has said, yeah, we will give you cash, but you have to sign up to conditions in return for that cash to avoid moral hazard. And you have to be getting bailout cash from the ESM before you get bailout cash from the OMT. The problem here for political swiftness or for swiftness is that in order for a country to get cash from the ESM, it has to get the approval for the, from the Bundestag, which is the German parliament. And that comes back to sovereignty. In order for a, a country to tap the ECB, it has to go through the ESM and therefore the German Bundestag. So it's not as quick as people think it is. And it hasn't been tested yet. But when it gets tested, it will come back to national politics and whether the Bundestag will approve the ESM loan and therefore the OMT program. And of course, all is well so far because it hasn't been tested. No one has, it's there, it's unlimited, so markets are happy. But if it comes to, comes to a point when Spain really has to tap the ESM and OMT and the Bundestag doesn't want, to, want that to happen, then we're looking at a big crisis. And again, that illustrates my previous point. Behind all of this, there's still huge political limitations. And the second catch, of course, is that um, in the past, this idea of using cheap, cheap central bank money to paper over deep economic cracks haven't worked particularly well. And that brings me back brings me to your point, Mark, which is that if indeed Europe needs competitiveness uh, to thrive and to get back on the sort of economic arena globally, then perhaps flooding the European economy with cheap ECB cash and take away the incentive for reform is not the best idea in the long term. So it comes with short term benefits, but it's politically hugely complicated and it has the potential to, to, uh, to generate long term costs, which are, could potentially be very great indeed. On what the rest of the world can do for Europe, two things, invest in us and pray for us. Yeah. And on that note, I think we'll have to wrap up because we're out of time. So thank you so much to our panelists for their really interesting comments. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Just a quick, uh, quick uh, comment that we're all going to go to the bar for a drink. If you want to quiz the panellists more about their ideas on the Eurozone, come and join us. Otherwise, have a lovely evening. Hope to see you at the Union, the Wilberforce Society, or the Marshall Society again soon. Bye.